In the mid-1930s, the British Air Ministry saw the future of aviation in faster, more powerful aircraft and predict the need for engines capable of producing 2,000 horsepower. In response, Rolls-Royce aimed to meet this demand with an ambitious design, a 24-cylinder liquid-cooled engine called the Vulture, shaped in an X configuration. The Rolls-Royce Vulture was the brainchild of Albert George Elliott, with development kicking off in September 1935. The engine featured a two-piece aluminum crankcase that was split horizontally along the crankshaft's centerline. Each half had mounting surfaces for cylinder banks positioned at a 90-degree angle. These halves were secured with 28 cross bolts and additional smaller bolts along the parting flange. The cross bolts were arranged in a staggered pattern to prevent interference. Each side of the crankcase also had two mounting pads for engine attachment. At the core was a hollow six-throw crankshaft held in place between the crankcase halves and supported by seven main bearings for stability. Each of the four monoblock cylinder banks was crafted from aluminum with an integrated cylinder head. Steel liners were fitted into each of the six cylinders within the banks. These banks were fastened to the crankcase by 26 long studs that ran through the top of the bank. The cylinder spacing was increased compared to the Kestrel to accommodate larger connecting rod bearings and to allow for future upgrades in bore diameter. Each cylinder was equipped with two intake valves and two sodium-cooled exhaust valves. A single overhead camshaft controlled the valves for each bank, driven by bevel gears, and a vertical shaft connected to the gear reduction at the front of the engine. The Vulture's connecting rod assembly was built around a master rod extending at a 45-degree angle from a square-shaped big end, with three articulating rods branching from the other corners. The initial design included a hinged cap on one side, secured to the crankshaft with two bolts on the other. However, the setup caused issues, so engineers replaced the hinge with a four-bolt configuration, two longer bolts on one side and two shorter ones on the other, to better secure the cap to the crank pin. Serrations on the mating surfaces ensured a snug fit. The design was also used in the Rolls-Royce X engine, developed slightly earlier. When viewed from the rear of the engine, the upper right cylinder bank was labeled with the A bank, with the designation continuing counterclockwise. The master rod controlled the D-bank, positioned at the lower right. At the front of the engine, a spur gear on the crankshaft connected to four compound lay shafts, which in turn drove the propeller shaft. This gear reduction system slowed the propeller speed to about 35% of the crankshaft speed while keeping it aligned with the engine's centerline. When viewed from the rear, both the crankshaft and the propeller rotated counterclockwise. A bevel gear at the back of each lay shaft powered the vertical shaft that drove the camshafts for the cylinder banks. Meanwhile, a spur gear at the rear of the crankshaft supplied power to the accessory drives and the two-speed single-stage supercharger. The supercharger's impeller spun at 5.464 times crankshaft speed in low gear and at 7.286 times in high gear. To assist cooling, a pump was placed on each side of the supercharger. The engine had a compression ratio of 6 to 1. Air entered the two-barrel SU carburetor and was funneled into the supercharger where it was compressed before being split into two streams one feeding the upper manifold and the other feeding the lower manifold between the respective cylinder banks. Each manifold had three outlets on either side, which connected to smaller manifolds running the length of the cylinder banks. Each cylinder received this air-fuel mix ignited by two spark plugs, one on the intake side and one on the exhaust side. Accessing these spark plugs was a challenge, requiring work from every angle, top, bottom, left, and right. The task was further complicated by the placement of the intake manifolds above and below and exhaust manifolds and engine mounts on the sides. As a result, the 24-cylinder Vulture was not popular with ground crews. Initially, the spark plugs were fired by a battery-powered coil ignition system, but this was later upgraded to two magnetos and distributors connected to the gear reduction system. Exhaust ports were positioned on both sides of the engine. To manage the high heat, the engine relied on a coolant mixture of 70% water and 30% ethylene glycol. The Vulture featured a 5-inch bore and a 5.5-inch stroke, giving it a total displacement of 2591 cubic inches, which is 42.47 liters. It could produce 1800 horsepower at 3200 RPM with 6 PSI of boost during takeoff. 3000 RPM with the same boost, it reached 1845 horsepower at 5000 feet and 1710 horsepower at 15000 feet. At 2850 RPM, the engine delivered 1780 horsepower at 4,000 feet and 1616 horsepower at 13,500 feet, with a maximum climb rating of 1760 horsepower at 5,000 feet and 1640 horsepower at 15,000 feet. For cruising, at 2600 RPM with 5 PSI boost, it produced 1540 horsepower in low gear and 1460 horsepower in high gear. The engine was substantial, measuring 87.2 inches in length, 35.8 inches in width, and 42.3 inches in height, with a total weight of 2,450 pounds. 
Preliminary testing of the Vulture engine began with an X4 test version, and it quickly highlighted issues with the early two-bolt connecting rod design. The bolts couldn't handle the stress and often failed, which led to the development of a sturdier four-bolt connecting rod. Another problem was insufficient lubrication of the main bearings, which needed addressing before moving forward. The first complete 24-cylinder Vulture ran on September 1, 1937, followed by another in January 1938 and a third in May of 1938. By November 1938, test engines had logged 1,150 hours of operation. During these tests, issues with the coil ignition system also became apparent, prompting a switch to magnetos. By 1938, the Vulture was producing 1,750 horsepower during testing. Vulture engine development went through several stages from Mark 1 to Mark 5. The Vulture 1 was built in small numbers mainly for testing purposes. The Vulture 2 was refined for use in multi-engine aircraft and featured a five-dried auxiliary gearbox connected to the engine via a flexible shaft that ran to a right-angle drive behind the A cylinder bank. The Vulture 2 first ran in September 1938. Interestingly, details about the Vulture 3 are scarce and remain unclear. The Vulture 4 was nearly identical to the Vulture 2, but was intended for single-engine aircraft. It had an engine-mounted three-drive auxiliary gearbox and some different accessories for optimized performance. The Air Ministry gave the green light for a Vulture engine production on March 23, 1939, expecting to need 1,560 of these power plants. Full production got underway in January 1940. However, the engine's maximum speed had to be dialed back to 3,000 RPM due to reliability concerns. To compensate, the boost pressure was increased to 9 PSI, keeping the takeoff rating at 1,800 horsepower. Development of the Vulture 5 came after the Vulture 4 and brought additional upgrades, including stronger supercharging. The impeller speed was increased to spin at 6.018 and 8.111 times crankshaft speed for low and high gears, respectively. This allowed the engine to deliver 1,995 horsepower at 3,000 RPM during takeoff with 9 PSI boost. Military power at the same setting was 2035 horsepower at 5,000 feet and 1840 horsepower at 20,250 feet. For cruising at 2650 RPM and 7 PSI boost, the Vulture 5 produced 1650 horsepower at 3500 feet and 1525 at 175. The Hawker Henley light bomber prototype K5115 was outfitted with a Vulture engine as a test platform. A ventral scoop was installed in the bomb bay to house the radiator and oil cooler, and the cowling was adjusted to accommodate the Vulture's four rows of exhaust stacks. A carburetor intake scoop was also added just ahead of the cockpit. The Vulture-powered Henley first took to the skies on April 17, 1939, and the engine passed its type test with an 1,800 horsepower takeoff rating in August of 39. A second Henley, L3302, was also converted as a test bed and made its first flight with the Vulture engine on May 3, 1940. The Vulture was earmarked for several aircraft projects, and four of these designs eventually flew. The Avro 679 Manchester medium bomber was designed to be powered by two Vulture 1 engines and was ordered as early as mid-1937, even before the final design was settled. Eventually, around 700 units were ordered. The Manchester prototype, L7246, took its first flight on July 24th, although some sources say July 25th, 1939. Once Venture 2 engines were available, they were installed in the Manchester and the aircraft officially entered service in November of 1940. The Vickers Type 284 Warwick medium bomber was initially ordered in October 1935, but plans changed to January of 37 to equip the first prototype K8178 with two Vulture 1 engines instead of the Bristol Hercules. K8178 took its first flight on August 13th of 39, and Vir Vulture 2 engines were installed in November of 1940. Two prototypes of the Hawker Tornado Fighter were ordered in December of 38. The first prototype P5219 flew for the first time in October 6th of 39, powered by Vulture 2 engines. Production contracts followed in November of 39, with plans to use the upgraded Vulture 5 engine as the standard power plant. The second prototype, P5224, took to the skies on December 7th of 1940, equipped with the Vulture 5 engine. Meanwhile, the Blackburn B-20 flying boat, V8914, was ordered in 1936 and had its maiden flight on March 26, 1940. This experimental design was powered by two Vulture 2 engines and featured a unique extendable hull and retractable wing floats. Unfortunately, the aircraft was lost on April 7th of the same year after experiencing aileron flutter during a high-speed test flight. In March 1941, the improved Vulture 2 was put to the test, achieving a takeoff rating of 2,010 horsepower at 3,000 RPM with 9 PSI boost. At the same settings, its military power reached 1845 at 5,000 feet and 1710 at 15,000 feet. At 2850 RPM and 6 PSI boost, it had a normal rating of about 1,780 horsepower at 4,000 feet and 1,660 horsepower at 13,500 feet. 
But despite these impressive numbers, things weren't looking good for the Vulture in actual service. The rush to get the Manchester into production and operational use meant that serious flaws in both the airframe and the Vulture engine were only discovered after it was too late. The engines were unreliable and prone to failure, leading to frequent groundings across the fleet. When a Vulture failed mid-flight, the Manchester often couldn't maintain altitude on a single engine, and in roughly 75% of cases, the aircraft crashed before it could make a safe emergency landing. Part of the problem was that the Battle of Britain forced Rolls-Royce to focus most of its resources on the Merlin engine, which delayed critical improvements for the Vulture. Some of the engine failures were traced back to cooling issues. One of the coolant pumps would sometimes cavitate, cutting off the flow of coolant to the, that side of the engine. When this happened, the cylinder banks on that side would overheat naturally, causing the engine to seize, sometimes resulting in engine fires. To address this, engineers installed a balance tube to equalize the pressure between the pumps and prevent cavitation. But cooling wasn't the only issue. The crankshaft's main bearing were another weak point. Failures were caused by a mix of overheating due to the cooling problems, poor lubrication, subpar bearing materials, and even slight misalignments in the crankcase halves. To fix this, Rolls-Royce reworked the lubrication system to reduce air bubbles, switched to stronger LA4 type bearing materials, and added locating dowels to keep the crankcase properly aligned. One of the most frustrating issues was the sudden failure of the bolts securing the connecting rod caps. These failures often led to cascading damages that completely destroyed the engine. The problem was traced to brittle bolts, so new measures were introduced. Stronger bolts and a lower torque specification to avoid overstretching them. Engineers also made slight adjustments to the connecting rod design. To further reduce stress on the engine, the maximum speed was dropped to 2850 RPM. These fixes, known collectively as Vulture Modification Number 44, were implemented by August 1941. Once these changes were made, some Manchesters with updated Vulture engines reliably reached 120 hours between major inspections and could make it back to an airfield even with one engine down. Eventually, the inspection interval was increased to 180 hours and the takeoff RPM limit was restored to 3000 RPM. However, more issues surfaced by late 1941. Exhaust manifolds started cracking, releasing jets of hot gases that damaged the engine cowling or other parts. These failures caused more engine shutdowns and airframe damage. Rolls-Royce designed a new, more durable manifold, and by December of 41, all older units had been replaced. Even though most of the Vulture's major problems had now been addressed, the engine still struggled with random issues. Failures, overheating, power loss, and excessive fuel consumption weren't uncommon. Confidence in the Vulture remained low. The Manchester bomber itself had other problems as well, leading to the end of its production run in November 1941. Of the 202 Manchesters built, about 33, which is 16.3%, crashed or were written off due to engine failure or fires. This figure doesn't include planes that were repaired after engine problems or the six or so lost to propeller-related issues, some of which led to engine failures. Unfortunately, many Manchesters were also lost after one engine was disabled in combat, leaving the remaining engine to overwork and fail while trying to keep the aircraft aloft. By mid-42, the Manchester was officially retired from operations and served in secondary roles until 1943, when the remaining aircraft were scrapped. The Manchester was redesigned with four Merlin engines and rebranded as the Lancaster, originally known as the Manchester III, which went on to become one of the most successful bombers of World War II. Meanwhile, production versions of the Warwick bomber ended up using Pratt & Whitney R2800s or a Bristol Centaurus engine. Although about 1,760 Hawker Tornadoes were initially ordered, only three Vulture-powered versions were ever built before the Napier Sabre-powered Typhoon took over as the chosen aircraft. By September 1942, the sole production Hawker Tornado R7936 was fitted with a Vulture engine using a contra-rotating gear reduction. This setup was used to test propellers made by Rodol and de Havilland. Some reports suggested that one experimental Vulture had its bore increased by 0.4 inches to 5.4 inches total, matching the bore of the Merlin engine. This modification increased the engine's displacement by 432 cubic inches to a total of 3,023 cubic inches, but there is no further documentation about this version. Starting as early as August of 1939, Rolls-Royce wanted to cancel the Vulture program so they could focus their efforts on the more successful Merlin and Griffin engines, but the Air Ministry was determined to keep the Vulture alive, so development continued despite the challenges. Eventually, the program was halted in October of 41, with production officially ended in March of 42 after 538 engines were built. Notably, the Vulture remains the only X-24 aircraft engine ever to enter production. Rolls-Royce had a series of upgrades in mind if Vulture production had continued. Namely, the connecting rod design was reworked, so the three articulating rods attached directly to the bearing cap, which would be secured to the master rod with four long bolts made from stronger material. The cylinder banks were updated to feature detachable heads for easier maintenance. The heavy compound lay shaft system would have been swapped for a lighter planetary gear reduction for the propeller. 
Lastly, the two-speed supercharger was set to be upgraded to a two-stage design to improve the engine's performance at higher altitudes. Only a few Vulture engines still exist today, and most were recovered from Manchester wrecks. Two of these engines are on display at the Aerial Warfare Museum, Fort Velduis, in Heemskerk near Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Another Vulture engine, primarily made up of its crankshaft connecting rods and cylinder barrels from the B-20 aircraft it showcased at the Dumfries and Galloway Aviation Museum in Scotland. The Royal Air Force Museum also holds three Vulture engines, all believed to have come from Manchester bombers. One of these is on loan to the Rolls-Royce Heritage Trust and can be seen at the Hucknall Flight Test Museum. Many sources mentioned that the Vulture 1 had an updraft carburetor, while the Vulture 2 had in later versions switched to a downdraft carburetor. However, the only aircraft known to have flown with an updraft carburetor was the first Tornado prototype, which reportedly had a Vulture 2 engine. Early Manchesters that flew with Vulture 1 engines seem to have used downdraft carburetors. The most reasonable, albeit uncertain, explanation is that all Vultures used downdraft carburetors, and the updraft setup on the Tornado prototype was likely a one-off design to improve the pilot's forward visibility and reduced external protrusions. The Vulture is a prime example of an ambitious avant-garde engine design driven by the quest for more power. While many engines like the Vulture have faded into the background compared to more conventional designs, they still deserve recognition for their role in pushing the limits of what was possible.